I'll be presenting principles of management of hand infection. I'll be using this outline. The hand is a very important part of the body. It serves very important functions as human beings in everyday life with communication and carrying out various daily activi activities. Our dexterity and opposable term separates us from other species. Hand infections occur commonly, especially in plastic surgery, which active um, young adults, especially those who neglect minor trauma. It occurs in patients with severe infections, patients that have an um, impaired immune status. Determ and determination of the outcome of patients with hand injuries is significantly dependent on the early identification and intervention. It is very paramount as plastic surgeons to be knowledgeable and efficient in management of hand injuries. From evaluation and intervention can be a determining factor to determine whether a patient will have a good outcome or permanent disability. To do a brief anatomy function of the hand, the hand is separated into the dorsal and palmar surfaces. The dorsal is characterized by skin, which can be pulled off from the on, underneath the underlying surfaces. The palmar surface has um, various compartments and various at attachments or, and potential spaces. Infection can be well confined in the hand. We have, depending on the areas of the hand, we have infections affecting the digits and affecting the, the palmar region, affecting the um, if either from superficial down to deeper tissues. Sensory innervation is broadly by the terminal branches of the median, ulna, and radial nerves. And then we also have blood supply coming both through digital arteries, either by the palmar arc, the radial, ulna, and arteries. Palmar surface can be divided into various compartments as a result of various septates that may form potential spaces in the hand. Infections can affect various aspects of the hand, which include the nail fold, which is just adjacent to the nail plates. We also have the digital pulp spaces, which is the soft tissue around the distal phalanges. Then it can also affect the web spaces, the tendon sheets, which is the synovia encasing that encases the synovia sheets that encase the tendon and can affect gliding movements of tendons. We also have deeper infections, which affect the deeper palmar spaces. About 60% of hand infections is caused by trauma. Trauma from trivial um, injuries from um, laborers, about 30% occur from human bites and 10% from animal bites. Hand infection accounts for about 20% of all surgical hand admission. The risk factors for hand infections include the following. The age of the patient, age of 20 and above to about 65, are usually more prone to hand infections simply because they are more active and are prone to having hand infections. Occupation. Usually patients especially dog groomers or people that groom dogs, they will be more susceptible to animal bites. Patients that take and people that take care of aquariums, gardeners are usually more susceptible to susceptible to infections such from various uh, microorganisms such as, such as pasturella and echinella from bites from both dogs and, and human beings. Patients with immunosuppression such as patients with diabetes mellitus Patients with hepatic diseases, renal diseases, long-term comorbidities are also known to have more significant or increased morbidity when they have hand infections. Patients also who smoke because of ischemia and increased carbon monoxide into the tissue, and there's also increased susceptibility to these hand infections. Patients that use that intravenous drug users, especially when they use dirty or contaminated needles for um, intravenous drug use, can also increase the susceptibility to development of hand infections. Hand infections can be classified based on the causative agent as well as the layer or the line of tissue that is affected. For the causative agent, the most common causative agent are usually bacterial infections with the Staphylococcus aureus being the most common agent that is commonly identified. Viral infections too can also occur, especially with herpes simplex virus, which causes the hepatic wheat, wheat low that we know. Then we also have the fungal infections such as Candida albicans, which can be seen with patients that are immunosuppressed or patients that are frequent dishwashers where there's removal of the normal flora and then there's now in increased opportunity for opportunity infection. 
Also, it can also be based on the tissue or the level of tissue involved, which is either superficial or deep. For superficial infection, it affects the skin and subcutaneous tissue. It is usually superficial to the adjacent tendon. And this includes cellulitis, lymphangitis, paronychia, pop space infections, and web space infections. For the deeper infections, we have the ones within the synovia sheet, also known as tenosynovitis, the deep facial space infections, infections affecting the bones and necrotizing tissue, which affects multiple segments of tissue up down to the muscular layer. Cellulitis is a diffuse infection affecting the subcutaneous tissue without pot formation. It is usually characterized by widespread, warm, tender area of erythema with um, associated swelling edema, which is well demarcated and progresses over time if there's no intervention. For the lymphagitis, this is usually infection affecting the lymphatics, which can also be seen in, uh, as a form of superficial hand infection. It has a needle which has erythematous streaks that spread up, up to the arm. It can be associated with as an, um, regional lymphadenopathy. Here is a picture of a patient with lymphagitis of the hand extending to the arm. For digit infections now, the one of the most common one we have is the paronychia, which is the infection affecting the lateral folds, the lateral folds at the nail edge. And um, it is usually um, commonly seen following manicures or nail biting. Um, Staphylococcus aureus, as mentioned before, is one of the most frequently isolated organisms found. And it can be characterized by erythema, pain around the nail plates, and swelling. Usually the patient will complain of swelling around the lateral parts of the nail edge, as can be seen in this picture. In, in children, it can also be seen with, in children who have um, frequent thumb sucking. The felon or the pulp space infection, focal infection usually involving the pulp space, which is the soft tissue that is underneath the nail plates of the finger. It is on the palmar surface of the distal phalanges. Usually occurs following a puncture wound. Staphylococcus aureus is the most frequently isolated organism, affecting both um, thumbs and index fingers are most commonly affected. Patients usually complain of pain, which is usually worse, throbbing pain, which is usually worse on dependent position, there may be associated redness and um, swelling of the pulp of the finger. Next is the hepatic whitlow, which is more, more common, it's an infection caused by herpes simplex virus one and two. It usually can be characterized as a single vesicle or a cluster of vesicles that come together following an incubation period of two to 20 days. They may be patient may have preceding flu-like symptoms of weakness, low-grade fever, and excessive tiredness. Often, often, these vesicles appear clear initially and then soon become yellow or turbid. And then what they form, they come together to form a big blister, which eventually ruptures a sipping discharge and underlying tissue has a honeycomb appearance. Sometimes it can often be taken for upspace infection. However, there's no precipitation of flu-like symptoms as, a, as seen in hepatic with flu. Patients may also have fever. There may be regional lymphadenopathy. For web space infection, usually this is infection affecting the interdigital web space. It can form a subcutaneous abscess. It may be on palmar and dosa aspects simultaneously. Known as the collar button abscess in the 19th century, it is usually as a result of penetrating injury, it can occur when fissures are present. Here is a picture showing the web space infection of the hand, which begins usually at the palmar surface, and then it now seeps through, going to the deep transverse metacarpal ligament, to the dorsal aspect of the skin. For deeper infections, which are infections are deep to the tendon, within the tendon or beneath the tendons, the flexor or extensor tendons, as the case may be, we have synovial space infections, or tenosynovitis, which can affect the tendons, flexor, or extensor tendons of the hand. Synovia sheet is a two-layered structure that encases the tendon of the hand. And usually, when infection occurs here, there is reduction of gliding properties of the tendon affecting movement, and also susceptible to infection because it has poor blood supply and synovial fluid. So that says, serves as a, a good medium for bacterial growth. And then what happens is that with infection, there's increased pressure within the synovial sheet, 
and there's compression of the capillaries, vessels, and venous and arterial supply, which leads to ischemia and that can lead to necrosis and thrombosis of this affected hand. So definitely this is a, a surgical emergency that requires intervention in order to prevent permanent disability. It usually occurs as a result of trauma, although contiguous spread from adjacent infections in the hand may also cause it from more superficial infections, which have not been addressed, can spread continuously to um, deeper tissues. It can also be as a result of hematogenous spread from distance infection. For the flexor tenor cervitis, Clinically, there are pathognomonic features that indicate the flexor tenosynovitis. Because of the inflammation affecting the sheet of the tendon, usually patients will feel pain along that sheet of the flexor tendon. There's usually a uniform or falciform enlargement of that affected digit. The finger appears to be in a fixed, flexed position at rest. This is um, an illustration of a patient with flexor tenosynovitis, also known as can Canavel sign. For deep facial space infections, usually there are potential spaces that occur within the palmar, deep within the palmar surface, within the palmar region of the of the hand. They are usually deep to the tendons, but superficial to the interosseous insertion or interosseous muscle. Tenal space, which is on the lateral aspect of the palmar area of the hand, we have the hypotenal space which is on the medial aspect, and then we have the mid palmar space. And then we have the dorsal aponeurotic space, which is infection usually occurs as a result of penetrating trauma, but also contiguous and hem hematogenous spread can occur. For patients with tenal space abscess, usually there's swelling, there's redness, and there's a deformity where the patient has the hand in abducted position, and then there's pain an attempt of adducting the hand. So the dorsum of the hand and the eminence feels full, and then the hand appears abducted. The thumb appears abducted. And there's fullness of the web space, of the first web space. There's usually pain, redness, swelling, and associated um, deformity that I just described. In mid palmar abscess or palmar infection, there's a full swelling, complete swelling of the palmar aspect of the hand with the loss of the concavity of the palmar surface. Usually the palmar surface is usually concave for easy grip, but that concavity is lost and there's gross edema, redness, and pain on the mid palmar abscess formation. It's usually fluctuancy as well. For other um, deeper infections, which can affect also the bone or the joints, we have septic arthritis, which uh, can be a bacterial fungi or mycobacterial infection affecting the joints, usually monoarthritis affecting the joints. There's pain on, or tenderness on movement of the joint, as well redness and swelling, as well as limited range of motion of the, across the joint. We also have necrotizing fasciitis, which is a rapidly progressive life-threatening infection. It's caused by both anaerobic and aerobes and anaerobic um, microorganisms. It is characterized by widespread pressure necrosis with relative sparing of the underlying muscles usually caused by a toxin-producing bacterium. Often patients will be severely dehydrated. They may prevent septic with various imbalances or electrolyte imbalances. This is usually a surgical emergency and requires immediate intervention. Patients with hand infections who majorly present as elective cases or not as emergency situations. Emergency situations usually for patients who have had it, um, maybe they've neglected the minor trauma and it has progressed to the point of necrotizing fasciitis where the patient will require immediate resuscitation. Usually for the management of this patient or patients with hand infection, we'll need to take a full detailed history, which will include the patient's bio data, age, the occupation to, for patients that may have um, managed, that may be working with animals or rare animals or dogs. There are some specific microorganisms such as fasciarella, which they are more subset, which are more, more, more commonly occurring and and most and um, that cause the infections in this patient. Then you also want to establish the hand dominance of this patient, the previous, the previous injury, could it have been a trauma incident, could it have been a human bite from a fight or a needle prick, as the case may be. Then the history of infection, the duration, the symptoms that may have occurred, 
they usually patients will have pain. Most of them will have pain. There will be acidic swelling. There will be redness. There will be reduction in function. And then sometimes there may be discharge, which may be a um, virulent discharge for patients that have have deep, maybe deep seated infections that have that have formed abscesses. Then also the progression of the infections. Patients may have systemic dissemination and may have fever. There may also be comorbidities. These patients, you want to identify the comorbidities and immune status because this further affects the prognosis of the patient. So that it's easy to identify early so that interventions can be made accordingly. And we also want to find out about um, patient's alcohol intake and smoking because this also will affect the prognosis of the hand. Patients may appear lethargic pyrexia and should be checked for pallor and regional lymphadenopathy should also be accessed. Hand and the wrist and the upper limb should be examined thoroughly to identify the presence of redness or skin changes, edema, there may be associated deformity or upper limb. Patients may also have open wound. You want to assess the alignment of the finger. Is there loss of the cascade? Is the patient in, is the finger, affected finger in fixed flexed position? Is there fluctuancy all over the swelling, which tells us, gives us an idea of an abscess? Will it be crepitus that could in, indicate that patient may have a clostridial infection? Also want to assess the neurovascular status of the hand, associated tenderness, and then range of motion across all the joints. Investigations are really supportive. You will do a full blood count for this patient, which will show features of leukocytosis with or without reduced pack cell volumes. We also want to do a wound swab, microscopy, culture, and sensitivity for these patients, which will identify the causative agent and can tailor our antibiotic choice down to the sensitivity of the organism cultured. Also, we want to assess patients' renal and liver function for patients with comorbidities or to identify patients that may have comorbidities that may affect the progression and the and the prognosis of their hand infection. Then also want to do radiographs or imaging for this patient, which will include x-rays or radiographs of the hand, which may show if there may be a foreign body that have been propagating the inflammatory response. Patients may have of gas in the soft tissue, which may be a clostridial infection in this patient. There may also be periosteal elevation of thickness, especially if there is bone involvement for patients that may now develop osteomyelitis or arthritis, as the case may be. For deep-seated abscesses, especially for deep pressure um, infections, we want to do an ultrasound for this patient to so identify the pockets where the pus may have collected. Differential diagnosis for patients with hand injury include gout or pseudogout. Patients will have abnormal uric acid elevation in gout or calcium pyrophosphate elevation in patients with pseudogout. Patients that may have pyodema granulosum may also be mistaken for patients with hand infection because they appear to have ulcerations with the central area of necrosis. But however, in these patients, there will be also associated features of chronic inflammatory diseases. Patients may also have metastatic tumor that may have disseminated in this patient. But of course, you have previous history of the primary tumor. Goals of treatment. The goals of treatment in patients with hand infections is to alleviate symptoms, to eradicate the focus of infection, to restore function and anatomy, and to prevent and treat complications. Treatments can either be surgical or non-surgical. Usually, the general measures for treatment of patients with hand infection will include elevation in order to facilitate venous and lymphatic drainage and reduce edema in this patient. Tetanus prophylaxis cannot be overemphasized, especially for patients where there's suspected trauma or puncture wounds. Splinting of an immobilization of this of the affected limb, usually in the position of function. Broad spectrum antibiotics is usually used, usually with both anaerobic and, and aerobic and anaerobic micro microorganism cover. Hot compressions can also be done to further facilitate vasodilation and reduce um, the inflammatory response following the infection. For surgical intervention, usually for patients with uh, deep seated abscesses and patients with deeper um, infections, such as fasci necrotizing fasciitis, tenor, flexor tenor, tenovitis, patients with septic arthritis, 
and usually surgical interventions are indicated for these patients. Usually for patients with anikia, you can do a partial or complete nail plate remover and also to open the epinokia and folds for, for open drainage of the abscess. Incision and drainage of abscess is usually done for patients with deep-seated infections. For patients with necrotizing fasciitis, we do debridement of necrotic tissues and then definitive closure when the patient is optimized and the wound bed is clean. For intra-op principle, for digital hand infections, we do regional anesthesia. Usually we can use a wrist block or a digital block. Incision is usually longitudinal over the greatest area of um, fluctuancy in order to drain, for instance, pulp space infections. Use of fine instruments and dissection along anatomical plates because the digits are, but they have end arteries. So the vascular compromise cannot be tolerated. So it's important that dissection be done with good knowledge of anatomy to avoid increased morbidity. So hemostasis should be um, secured at all times. We can use wicks um, to, for the digital infections in order to keep the incisions open prevent closure for and um, reaccumulation of pus. Here are a few of the incisions that are used for both um, digital or uh, deep fascia um, infections for drainage of for the ten tenal space, mid tenal space, hypotenal space. Post-operative principles will include use of broad spectrum antibiotics, elevation, good analgesia, rehabilitation, and physiotherapy. Complications of hand infections can include osteomyelitis and contractures. Patients may also have amputations for patients that eventually poor, either they come late or there's poor management. They may eventually need amputations of digits or the hand, as the case may be. And then also patients may have psychosocial difficulties, especially reintegrating back into normal society. In conclusion, hand infections are relatively common in plastic surgery. Prompt evaluation and intervention can be the determining factor between an excellent outcome or permanent disability. Therefore, understanding of pathology evaluation and its management is paramount in order to improve outcome. These are my references. Thank you. Can I chip in before we proceed? Still on this prophetic yes, yes, yes. low and then the insect bites? Yes, Chief. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so concerning the difference with the how you identify i think the question was um how you differentiate uh herpetic whitlow from the bacterial whitlow i think that was the question that the uh, dr agatha was asking am i right yes ma'am aha uh -huh. so usually you know most times because our patients present late you may not actually be able to to identify or like differentiate between the herpetic whitlow specifically and the bacterial with low. Now, why is this? Now, this is because most patients will not notice that, you know, will not notice those typical features of herpetic with low. Usually, you know, in herpes generally, any kind of herpes, the patients will usually have a like a prodrome that is like, they'll have symptoms and also signs that will come long before the actual vesicles actually, um, you know, show up. So usually you might have that burning pain, some itchy pain, some abnormal sensation, you know, around the area of the finger, some weeks before the vesicles actually appear. Sometimes even as much as maybe two to three weeks before the vesicles actually appear. But, you know, our patients or even us, I mean, we might not identify that, isn't it? Yes. Until when the vesicles now appear. And then also another uh, thing that can confuse the difference between the herp herpes and the bacterial Whitlow is that usually, okay, fine, it's herpes. There's been the prodrome where you have like about two to three weeks before that time, you have those burning sensation, paresthesias, you know, pain around the area of the finger. But subsequently, there's also secondary bacterial infection of those vesicles. Do you understand? So you might not be able to actually identify whether, you know, differentiate between whether it's a viral infection, as in the herpes, or a bacterial infection because of the secondary bacterial infection that actually occurs in the vesicles following the herpes infection. I don't know whether you understand that. 
Yes, ma. Yes. And then usually the tenderness that you have, the pain that you have, you know, when the vesicles eventually occur, is usually less than if it's a bacterial infection, a, a bacterial whitlow, you know, that has occurred. And then, of course, commonly the bacterial whitlow is caused by the staphylococcus usually, and it heals usually within one to two weeks. Unlike the viral infections, we know it might take a bit longer, isn't it, to yes. heal? Yes. And then also maybe from the symptomatology, from the history, should I say, you know, uh, a person that has uh, herpes, uh, Wicklow, may actually have maybe some history of immunocompromise, you know, um, because maybe uh, they had that before and then there might be an, a reactivation you know, by stress or by illness and they might have like a resurgence of that week loop. Um, yeah, I think those are the differences. So I don't know whether that has helped in making you understand it a bit better. Yes, my, it has. Yes. And then uh, now on the insect bites. Yes, the insect bites. So commonly- I'm not hearing you at a point. Okay, sorry. Okay, what didn't you get? Sorry. Hmm. About a minute or when you were talking. Uh-oh, that's too bad. Can you hear me oh, now? Yes. yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So on the insect bites, you know, yes, Dr. Ashams mentioned that uh, most insect bites, commonly they cause maybe allergic infect, uh, allergic, um, you know, a, an allergic reaction on the skin. But you can also have a secondary bacterial infection also, you know, uh, that uh, you can have staphylococcus species or streptococcus species that can, because that area of the skin that has been denuded by the insect bite or by the insect uh, sting, you know, it's a bit friable. So it's quite easy for bacteria, which is usually streptococcus or staphylococcus to enter through that skin, causing a secondary bacterial infection, commonly a cellulitis. You can also have like an empatigo. I'm sure you would have uh, the medical officer, the house officer, the resident would have, if they've passed through pediatrics posting, they would have uh, come across empatigo, which is a highly contagious bacterial infection, usually causing like blisters and sores. And so because of that secondary bacterial infection, following the insect bite or the insect, insect sting, which has made the skin more vulnerable to bacterial you know, translocation, that usually occurs. I don't know whether you've, you heard me speaking. Was that clear? Yes, 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 it is. Okay, all right. So I think we can continue. You did not uh, talk about the test, how, how to diagnose it. Did you come across Zank test? T Z A N K. T Z A N K. No, sir, I did not. Uh -huh. So that is how to differentiate it, you know, to doing a test. You take the vesicles and then subject it uh, into using that test. You will see multinucleated giant cells as you scrape those um, vesicles. Then another difference is that the vesicles are usually superficial and multiple compared to other hand infection, which may just be a swollen area and usually deeper into the skin. Then even in the treatment, there's difference because it is not advocated that you will incise any hepatic with low because you'll be seeding this infection as opposed to something like felon or paranychia that you are expected to incise and drain out the pus that is under, which usually reduces the pain. So those are more, those are more additions in the uh, differences. The unique thing about the pop of the finger of the digits, either the fingers or the, or the thumb, is that the dermis is connected to the bone via septa. So those spaces, infection of any of all those, and those that space is divided into different um, compartments. So infection, that's why it's a tight space and the pain is so much and then the swelling. So any infection there will be very painful. Of course, from there, it can even get to the bone if the person is not well, um, if treatment is not adequate. Now, from after that, you remember the tendon sheets that uh, encycle the tendon. 
You forgot to mention about the bursa. We have the radial bursa also. We have the ulnar bursa. So the radial bursa is the continuation of the flexor tendon sheet of the thumb. Extends up to the um, proximal, the distal palm. I beg your pardon, the distal forearm. You get why we have the ulnar bursa, which is the tendon sheet of the little finger. Now encompasses the palmar aspect of the three middle three digits. You get both of these spaces, this radial and honor bursa co connect at the parana space. So that's where you can have a horseshoe. You can also have a horseshoe shape abscess when both of them connect at the space of parana. The importance of this is tell you that a simple infection like a felon that is not well treated of, or a flexor tenus and ovitis can extend to the space of paruna. You get. So you also your mid, your um, your spaces, you mentioned them, they are different in boundaries. We even have the lumbrical, the lumbrical canal that's that attached to the distal, some of the, the, the lumbricals attached to the distal part of the um of the of the of the flexor flexor um, um flexor deuterium profundus tendons. Infection in all those sheets can also extend through that lumbrical canal into the mid palmar space. So if you understand that all these things are interconnected, you mentioned hot compress. I think the it would have it warm compress is better. I think it's warm compress, not hot compress, so that will not even burn the hand. So the treatment for the pernicia usually you start from you know that it's most of the time to start. Um, the usually start from a cellulitic phase before you now have the abscess formed. So early on antibiotics. When there's an abscess, incision, and drainage, and then when it is a chronic, so it's a chronic paronychia that will do that masopalization, that just removal of the proximal parts of the of the eponychium, as you explained. So just to mention that, then the anesthesia. I'll, I'll eat later. The anesthesia for the for the yes, you mentioned correctly the local anesthesia. Don't forget that in places where there's abscess, because the he can he talk about the fact that if you inject around it, you can neutralize the anesthetic agent because of the acidic content of the effluent of the pus. So, yes, you rightly mentioned the digital block. If you are going to work on a palma infection, like a palma infection, they are not even sure extent. It's not be good appropriate to use a wrist block. So those ones we can use either we are doing an axillary block or even a GA. You get when you need to extend. Then um um the anesthesia, yes, that's the anesthesia. The incisions, important to note is that those incisions, incisions should be placed such that they don't cross the creases of the palm above. Um, they should not cross it beyond 45 degrees. You get because you don't want to have um, any deformity, any contracture over it. So incisions, apart from knowing the named incisions of the hand, you just take note as that of that as one of the principles. Of management, yes. Then, um, um, yes. One thing I forgot to also mention in the anatomy. You know, when you're talking about the dosal um space infection, dosal supraneurotic space is in the dosum of the hand. The dosal super, uh, super is on the dosum of the hand. And I think you made a mistake in that your anatomy. We're talking about the fact that the skin of the dosum is thicker. So I think you you mix it up slightly. So it's the skin of the the, the dosum is thin. And pliable. So that's why there's a lot of swelling. Sometimes infection on the palm will extend to the dosum. We have more swelling. So that's the reason for that your principle that you incite at the site of maximum. That's one of the reasons for the principle. Incision should be along the site of maximum um, tenderness, not fluctuance. Most especially in the palm because the skin of the palm is very and not um, pliable. So you use that and not the other one. So the question I have for you is this. If you are to do, if you are to take sample in a diabetic patient for for random or fasting blood sugar, which of the digits will you use? So when we we prick the fingers, the the yes. pops of the fingers, yes. Yeah. If you are, which of the which of the digits would you prefer for that and why? The middle three fingers. Remember, we mentioned that the thumb forms the radial bursa, right? The thumb, yeah, okay. the yes, yes, it continues, and then that of the little finger. You get so those ones are even more direct. So the the middle, either you are using the index, the middle, or the ring fingers. Do you get those ones are more? Preferred. As she talked about the finger, now the area just before the the nail 
is AP, that's EPI, epinucleum, right? Area around by both lateral, both sides is paranucleum. And the area distal to the nail is hyponucleum. So infection can be on either of it, though para is common. That's why it's called paronychia. Or you can have paronychia, you can have hyponychia also. So they are very, very rare. Now, if you have infection going across two or three of these zones, you can say roundabout, right? Uh, paronychia, because it's not just one side that is affected. Anatomy will give you more understanding why you have such pulse both on the palmar and the dosal uh, surface of the hand, connected by a strand uh, or a narrow uh, passage. So now your topic is principles of management of hand infections, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Is there a difference between principles of management of hand infections and discuss the management of hand infections? It will include the pre-op principles, which will include um, for diagnosis, which will be history, examination, investigation, the intra-op principles that we'll use, and the post-op principles. But in discussion of the management of hand infections, I think that will focus more on operative and non-operative discussions of the hand infections. Do you agree with her? In the principles, you may have to highlight and go to town to the principles of the major subheadings. The, the discussion will be lengthier than when we are just talking about the principles of management. So there is a difference in the two different topics. Principles of management of hand infections. It wants to evaluate how you would clinically manage the patient, a patient that presents to you at the emergency department or at the outpatient department with a hand infection. Do you understand? So, and that will include general and also specific principles, bearing in mind that there are various types of hand infections, isn't it? Yes. Now, the principles of management of hand infections, they don't expect you to go to town in depth about each of the specific hand infections as, you know, just like how you did. If you noticed, you, you talked about the individual hand infections first before you now went to, okay, principles of management. What he wanted was for you to manage the patient as a whole. The patient has come to you, you take a history, you go to town about the history, what you're looking out for. Is the patient a male or a female? Is the patient right-handed or left-handed? Is it an occupational injury the patient had? Was it at home? Was it on the road? Was it by the gutter? Because that will have a bearing on how you're going to manage the patient, when the patient eventually comes to you. Yeah, the hobbies of the patient. Discuss management of hand infections. Go to town individually about each of these hand infections. That's not to say that, oh, we don't expect you to know how to manage uh, paronychia, uh, hepatic wheat low, and all those other hand infections. But they want you to cone down on how you are going to manage a patient that will present to you at the outpatient department, in the emergency department with a hand infection. You introduce the topic of the hand. You talk about the hand, the importance of the hand. The hand is a pre the prehensile part of the upper limb and it is distal to the wrist. And we know that hand, in hand uh, infections can cause a great handicap to our patients. And then of course, yes, the anatomy, bearing in mind that the hand is a complex structure comprised of the skin, blood vessels, nerves, intrinsic and extrinsic muscles, tendon sheaths, you know, bones, joints, all tightly packed within a confined space. And then, of course, just briefly, you mentioned and talk about the functions of the hand, you know, okay, you use it for prehension, perception, you use it to identify, you use it as a means of communication, you use it for, it's, uh, it's regarded also as, um, you know, as a cosmetic you know, structure, because some people admire beautiful hands, isn't it? Yes. And then, of course, yes, you talk briefly about the epidemiology, as I mentioned before, your clinical evaluation, history to elicit whether or not the patient is an immunocompromised patient or not, the history of trauma, whether there are any other parts of the hand affected, any other parts of the body affected, because remember that you are managing the patient as a whole. And then, of course, your examination findings. 
in your investigation, hand infections are mainly a clinic, you know, it's usually a clinical diagnosis. However, your radiographs, sometimes maybe CT scans, MRIs, and ultrasound scans. Clinical photography is very, very important. You'd like to follow up the patient still with clinical pictures. And then, of course, if you have any operative intervention, you would like to take some of your post-operative uh, pictures. Then, of course, your aims. What are your aims? Your main aim is to achieve a supple, of course, you're sensate, you're pain-free, you're coordinated, acceptable-looking hand, isn't it? General principles. You'd like well-padded dressings. You'd like to elevate your hand. You'd like to splint, of course, your tetanus, your antibiotic prophylaxis. You'd like to give adequate analgesia for your patient to be comfortable. And then, of course, post-operatively, you need to have your adequate positioning, still your elevation. Subsequently, you may need some splinting, some static or some dynamic splinting, early physiotherapy, still adequate analgesia, and, of course, occupational therapy. Reintegrate the patient back to his or her job and also to carry out his or her normal activities. People that are more at risk of developing hand infections, of course, manual workers, housewives, dishwashers, washmen, isn't it? Housemaids, manual workers that use their, your hands, your carpenters, your plumbers, you know, they're more uh, at risk. Of course, your immunocompromised patients, dental workers. So why, why do you think that is so? Why do you think that the hand infections don't commonly present in the emergency department nearby a local chemist shop? So usually you don't see them until they become, you know, complicated. Only at the emergency department, sometimes at the outpatient department. The other organisms apart from Staphylococcus aureus that are implicated in uh, bacterial hand infections include the Streptococcus viridans, the beta hemolytic strep, then of course your anaerobes, and then your atypical mycobacterial infection. Commonly spontane spontaneous following trivial scratches or injuries. And then sometimes, of course, following major injuries. And then, yes, less commonly animal bites and uh, human bites. So, yes, principles of treatment. I, I talked about that. Your history, rest, elevation, antibiotics, drainage, and debris monitor. That's general principles. Splinting physiotherapy. Sometimes operative treatment. General examination. Remember that it's not just the hand that you're going to examine. You're going to examine the patient as a whole. You're going to examine for lymph nodes, general examination to rule out patients that, have, that are immunocompromised. Patient might not uh, reveal that they have some form of chronic illness and it's following your general examination that you may be able to elicit, you know, some stigmata of uh, chronic uh, disorders. You may need to do some other investigations that include your microbiological smears, your POS for MCS, and then, of course, as I mentioned before, other imaging techniques. You can't just say incisions to all of them. Incisions for paranychium different from that of phelon, different from that of uh, tenosynovitis. But treatment of tenosynovitis can be open or closed. Where you can open and drain close, you can do two incisions, one proximal, one distal. The proximal one is just proximal to A1 pulley. See the importance of the anatomy. The distal is just distal to A4 pulley. Then you now put in your tube and irrigate. So you can do that close method. So incisions vary depending on the pathology that you have. And then it is advised that the three middle fingers, if you must make an incision, the incision should be on the ulnar side of those fingers. Whereas the thumb and the ring finger, the incision should be on the medial sides, probably because of cosmetic reasons. It may just be a little bit hidden. But of course, like we've said, it depends on the most uh, painful sites can just inside where there is no nothing on the so clinical uh, evaluation still provides I mean supersedes that take local experience here yes. in your local experience which ones do you see commoner never mention anything about fasciotomy because some of them like you say could come with compartment syndrome so there's room for fasciotomy to relieve and then save the hand.